Nah. Our soon coming king, we do total almighty God for the beauty of the gift of life, our health and strength. Even here in this particular part of the world in the last days. And I will note exclusively, we say here in this particular part of the world, we're in the belly of the beast. And it is really an extremely interesting time in which to be alive here in these last days in this particular region of the world. More often than not, we don't take the seriousness of the time and not just the small details because there are times in which we will get caught up in the small details and miss the significance of the big picture. And as I say here in this particular part of the world in which we reside, this is an intricately detailed part of the big picture. Matthew 13, 10, when asked the primary question, Yahshua did tell the disciplined ones that it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them that are without, it is not given. And for that cause, we as Yahweh's people, we have an advantage. We have a leg up on all of the society. It's like the position on a racetrack, you would think that those that are positioned further out on the circle would have the greater advantage because they appear to be in the lead, but because it starts in a circular format, they're still equally spaced. However, such is not the case with Israel and Yahweh's word of prophecy has given the full-fledged advantage unto Israel first and then unto all the world that will thereby follow suit with their obedience of Yahweh's words. So we remind each other and one another of the significance of that. We are a people who love, and I hate to say this, but it is true. We are a people who love to be seen. We love to be flamboyant. We like to be the ones out front only until the pressure hits. And when the real pressure hits, you will see many people back away. Remember now, in the day of Yahshua, many people were with him, but when that pressure sure enough hit, even the disciplined ones who had not been fully endued with the power of the Ruah, even they too faded away or backed away from him. But when Yah strengthened them, oh, just as Ezekiel says that Israel will stand upon their feet and be an exceeding great army, it is because of those disciplined ones that the word of Yah went forth the way and the manner that it did. They caught on to an understanding of the big picture. And we as Yahweh's people are going to have to do just that. And we don't understand that sometimes things may be unimaginable to us, but because they're unimaginable does not mean that they're not as Yahweh's people, that some things you can tell the direction it's going based upon what the word of Almighty Yahweh says. I implore you, keep one another in mind, be prayerful, and do not give up the faith. I don't care what you suffer, Yisrael, and I don't mean I don't care. I mean, I don't care what we suffer. Know that Yahweh is there. Regardless of what we go through, know that he is there. Yahshua said as well, I choose the death in which my servants die. However we die, in life and in death, if we live properly, we glorify him and his Abba, almighty Yahweh. We're going to have to receive that and accept that. So don't you all lose faith when family and friends back away from you, especially as the time grows more evil. They're going to back away from you, okay? Wait on Yahweh. Yahweh's going to avenge himself. He's going to vindicate himself. He's going to prove himself. You and I have nothing to prove. I posted something the other day on this social media trap about the fourth uh, vaccine that this, uh, Israel's already doing, the fourth vaccine. So anyway, I posted something about that. And I know a brother, an Afrocentric brother here in Baltimore, they're real heavy into their Afrocentricity and all that. They'll condemn us. They, for some reason or other, they really do. Even when they're so-called friends with you, they despise Hebrews. And, and a lot of times, it's us as Hebrews. We tend to rub people the wrong way. We try to 
force the truth on people. That's not what y'all commands us to do. We got to live it, teach it, and don't back down off of it. But when they won't receive it, it's like trying to go into a wolf's den. And you're going to force the wolf to accept you. That wolf will fight you. You come up into their den, wherever it is that they reside, they're going to fight you. So we have to know that about the world. Afrocentric friend of mine, he went off about the post, you know, explaining all these different family members that were afflicted with COVID-19 and put in hospitals on ventilators and all the people that he knew that died as if I was mocking it. I've never mocked it a day in my life. And by not knowing or by me not broadcasting everything that I know and everybody that I know has been through, even if someone has died from it, whatever the case may be, you automatically assume we don't know what we're talking about. And, it, and my responses to him back and forth sort of pissed him off a little bit to a point where he called me. And that's where you get bold and ballsy when you decide to call somebody because they don't say what it is that you want them to say. But by the end of the conversation, I felt compelled to pull out the big guns in Yahweh's word and remind him. Now, look, as a Hebrew, when you all had me come and speak at your organization, you all were interested in none of the things that we had to say. However, all the African-centered gods that you believe in, what are those gods saying about this disease? What are they saying about the makers and the manufacturers of this disease? What are they saying about the fact that nobody can speak the truth without being somehow, someway systematically shut down? Things are filtering through and it's getting out there slowly, but, slowly. but believe me, they're shutting down a lot more than what most of us really can come to understand. And I said to him, we trust in Yahweh. When we are sick or whatever the case may be, we put all our trust in Yahweh because the scripture says, blessed are they that put their trust in him. And we put all our trust in Yahweh. But what are the African gods saying? How are the African gods healing you? Because I learned us and really are, but with all that African stuff, and I've said before, it's going to take more than wearing a bunch of African clothes now. And it's going to take more than just dressing up to get delivered from this. We're going to have to dress up the inner man. And the world doesn't seem to believe us or understand that. And this is where we say to Israel, calm down. Because it took over 25 years for Yahweh to bust these types of people and these type of organizations down to a point and degree where they don't even really see it. Their Afrocentricity is great because it's a cultural thing that lifts them up, makes them feel proud to be black, to be African-American or whatever it is that they are this week. Well, white people have been doing that all along. So now their thing is falling. What's lifting them up? What's holding them up? They're holding to the last vestiges of hope as white world supremacists. We're holding on to the last vestiges of hope as sons and daughters of the slaves. And yet it ain't working. Jeremiah 16, 19 surely says that we're going to come to acknowledge that our fathers have inherited vanity and lies and things in which there is no profit. So Yahweh's people are going to have to just simply hold on. You're going to have to calm down. You're going to have to learn that. You're, you're, some of you all are starting to learn right now. If you're in my age group, if you're 50 and above, some of you all are starting to learn that your, grandparent, your grandparents were a lot smarter than you actually gave them credit for. Now tell the truth now. See, when your grandparents were coming along and you were looking at them, having all those dozens of jars of pickles and tomatoes and all that stuff and they were canning you all thought that was the stupidest thing you ever seen they had grandparents who lived through the great depression and the uh hard times of the 1920s and the 30s or what have you so they had not gotten used to supermarkets full of food shelves completely stocked open 24 hours a day seven days a week so they hadn't gotten used to that. So they always suspected that hard times would come and they therefore kept plenty of food in reserve. Well, you and I come along, we the stupid generation. Our parents were spoiled. They didn't want to hear what their grandparents, what their parents had to say. Didn't want to listen. Things got a little better. Somewhere after the 60s and the 70s, the devil was allowed to loosen the noose off of the necks of the world and different things happened. And it happened in ways whereby we got comfortable. People went to college and got educated and got degrees in the 60s and 70s for free, pretty much. Later on, around the 80s and the 90s, college tuitions and things began to skyrocket. Wages began to drop and it dropped perpetually. For the last 50 years, the global 1% has sucked upwards in wealth of $21 trillion out of the earth. 
21 trillion. And that, when I say 21 trillion, that includes the quiet wealth now. The quiet wealth meaning those who have faded from the front pages of the Forbes or the Fortune magazine and the world's billionaire. They're still rich and billionaires, but they faded back so much, almost as if to be insignificant. And even then, they're part of the small details. They're not the big picture. The big picture, it is the Torah of Yahweh. It is the way to salvation. That's what you're after because that leads to everlasting life. Small details that tie into the big picture, Yahshua even threw it in their face. He said, what does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? You get the difference? This is why I always tell the children of Israel, calm down. Calm down. If they're approaching the war in the battleship, they don't take the men and set them on the side of the battleship and fire off little 22s and 25 automatic or even 38s. They don't shoot those things. They let them come in as close as they can. And them ships got cannons and all kinds of guns and different things and missiles. When they fire, they fire the big guns. Guess what, Al? Fire your little guns. Your little guns are your prayers to Yahweh. Collectively, it is energy, it is spirit. It is power with Yahweh. Pray for one another night and day. Because collectively, that's your big gun. Yahshua said unto us, Whatsoever you ask the Abar in my name, I will do it. That's your credit score right there. That's the highest credit score that there is. You have credibility with Yahweh and Yahshua. Credibility so that he said, whatsoever you ask in my name, I will do it. You're asking because he is the representative and he has sent you. So you can go to the Abba in prayer. That's what you ever have to learn. We got to calm down. It ain't about how much Hebrew you speak. Come on with that now. It ain't about how many Afro-centered garments or robes you have. It ain't about that now. We're looking at the world, man. We're looking at all the stuff of the world, the Hollywood fixation, the sports arena, uh, the dance shows, video gaming. We're looking at all the stuff that's soul stealing, soul destructive, as opposed to just being plain old Joe or plain old Jane and just serve Yahweh. It don't matter that you don't fit in with the world. Everywhere I go on a day by day basis, I find more and more. I do not fit in and I quietly rejoice in that. Hallelujah. I am not upset by not fitting in with anything in this world. You hear me? Not upset in the least. Come on. I walked up on some men the other day. They were talking about something. They like, nah, shh, shh, shh. Phone. Here you go. Phone off the hook. That was an old expression from the 70s. When they say phone off the hook, that meant, okay, somebody's listening in. So I responded, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to walk up on you fornicators and, and, and disturb you. Go on and do what you do. And I walked away. Now, for me, I was dead serious. Even though it was funny. I was dead serious. And I let him talk. I, I didn't go back over there no more that day about it. I didn't, come on, I ain't for that. I'm bringing all this up for a reason. Because see, we as Yahweh's people, we're looking at the world. We want to be like the world and all this stuff. As the world shuts itself down, it's shutting down because one is coming that is not Yahshua. And we don't want to be off base or off track by not properly preparing ourselves and our souls for what is yet to come. We got a little bit of work before us now. And there's nothing that any of us can do or say that's going to slow, that's going to thwart, or stop what's coming. And our only safe place of assurance is in Yahshua. We, we're going to have to understand that. And that's the key to Yahweh's word. I ain't sitting around arguing with nobody. A lot of times Hebrews, they like arguments and drama. You can have all the arguments and all the drama you want. I bet you won't catch me arguing with you. I'll say what I'm going to say about Yahweh's word. I'll shut down on you in a New York second. Anybody have been in New York, you know how quick that is. You know? No offense to New Yorkers. Don't y'all get offended now. Just, hey, look, Baltimore got its issues. New York got its issues. Florida got its issues. California got it. Come on. And germane to every area of the world is its own set of issues and principles that govern it. So whatsoever it may be, know for certain that that's the way it is. We as Yahweh's people are going to have to deal with that. So when we say New York second, I mean now they do certain things, they do it quick. Now you go there and park the wrong place here. You'll find yourself walking just as quick as you got up there. So in the same manner, we as y'all people are gonna have to learn how to shut down from the world to be quiet in the New York second. 
We'll be able to speak at the appointed time that Abba Yah granted unto us. I want you to hear something real quick. Let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 13. I want, I want to cover something real quick that Yahweh's people have to really look at. Now watch how in this, Yahshua covers something real quick. He covers the big picture and the small detail. He kills it real quick. Luke 13, 22. What did I do those things we call glasses? I thought I, anybody give me all kind of wipes and sprays. You never notice that, Deacon? They give me all kind of wipes and sprays to get the lenses clean, whatever. And every time I get up here, I never have any of that stuff. Now, uh, watch. Now, I'll get it in the mail next week. Somebody will send me a big old box. It's big full of wipes and <laughs> pampers and everything you can think of. Uh, anyway, Luke. 1322. Listen to this. And he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then said one unto him, Master, are there few that be saved? Valid question. Knowing that the times are so tight, the things are so uh, stiff and sophisticated upon him, knowing just how tight it was, he asked him, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter into the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. You hear that? You hear how he made that thing so plain and so clear? Many going to seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and has shut the door and you begin to stand without, and to knock at the door saying, Hamashiach, Hamashiach, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not from where you are. Then shall you begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in thy presence and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not from where you are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be gnashing and weeping. There should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And when you shall see Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and all the prophets in the kingdom of Yahweh, and you yourselves thrust out. That's serious. See how he covered it just that quick? Big picture, small details. He let them know, don't worry about how many are going to be saved, because that ain't your job. The big picture is that you strive. That's the big picture. That's what Israel has to get into. We got to really get our sights set in on the big picture. I'm going to show you all something. And Israel, when I do this, I always announce, don't go buying it because I do the review for you. It's like uh, Angie's List or Craig's List, if that still exists, what have you. When you're looking for a reputable plumber or an auto mechanic or somebody. So you go on there and you look at the listing and you look at the review of what it is that they are or what they do. And therefore your recommendation comes to you based upon just that. So, oh, well, they say they ain't no good. Uh, I was reading up about a car dealer and some other stuff. And they, people complain, I'll never take a car there again. I, they did this, they did that, blah, blah, blah. So I'm reading all the reviews, good and bad, trying to balance it out to see, okay, well, it looks like they got more good reviews than bad, but I had to pay attention to the bad. Okay, right now, everybody everywhere is teaching. I was looking in the book of Yahuda today, and I was looking in the book of Peter, and I noticed that even in the footnotes of my Torah, they were talking about how the apostles, and they mentioned the apostle Shaul as well, how the, the translators in the footnotes said they had a healthy obsession with false teachers or false doctrine. And I can understand that they did excruciatingly painstakingly focus in on the emergence of false teachers in Israel. False teachers will grab up the children of Israel and they'll focus you in on an inordinate amount of details that are part of Yahweh's word. But by not properly categorizing the big picture against the small details, a lot of times people who can't handle the big picture run to the small details because a whole lot of small details makes a whole lot of people look smart. And that's what a lot of people like. But I know a man, he teaches like that. He teaches like a scatterbrain. 
He'll start teaching and can't stay on the subject matter. He over make 10,000 points now. Now somebody probably say, that's, that's you, Elder. No, I mean, this person has no point to make. And when he goes to make a point, you can count on his point being a point that has no point to it. If I cover a lot of ground, it's because I'm going to tie it all back into something. But anyway, this brother, he, he just teaches like a scatterbrain. He just want to get all this stuff across that he know. And he'd be so hyped sometimes and be so busy rattling, it don't make no sense to even himself. So now, in the latter days, the scripture teaches us about these 10 kings. Now, I'm going to break this down for people because there's a, a lot of false doctrine going on. Everybody focused in on these men. I, I remember when Steve Coakley painstakingly taught the black community about the boule and what the group is. It's aristocratic. Uh, it's elite. Everybody ain't a part of it. This, that, and that. Now, almost any and everybody that's talking about it, they don't have no real information on the group because unlike what Coakley showed them and where to go get the information, they forgot all that. And now they don't know where to go and find any information on them. So they make it up and labeling almost any and everybody as the boule. My point being, it's a secret society of black men that's designed exclusively for the protection and the maintenance of a white world supremacist system. In other words, we know who you are. We know you're the world rulers. We also know you're vicious, you're violent, you're killers. Don't kill us. But if we have to serve up a larger portion of our people that you might spare us, then we are willing to do that. That's the tenets of the organization. The false teachers now are spreading that all over the place so that they got any and everybody looking at them like they the boule. I remember a woman years ago accused me of being in the boule. Poor little woman. She's Hebrew, but yeah, she didn't know any better back then. Now, Revelations tells us about these 10 kings that all have an agreement. They're going to put their power and strength together. And they're going to agree that, look, man, we got all this wealth. We got all this power. We're going to do this. We're going to do that with the beast, this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. And we're going to rock with him and roll with him. Now, there are some things that Elder Shula, he's dead and gone in Yahshua now. Hallelujah. Elder Johnson and Elder Jones, they're dead and gone in Yahshua now. Hallelujah. But they were standing for something. They were looking at something, particularly Elder Shula and Elder Johnson. They were looking at these particular issues. I told y'all to have been there with them, to have shared in their lives with them and their experiences in Yahshua, as well as to carry those things onward to now open it up just a little further than they did, that we might be able to look at some things in Yahweh's word, specifically Revelations 17, where it lays out. The fall of the global religion, the harlot and all that, and the ten kings stepping up to work with this beast, this anti-Messiah. But the world is being hurried into something. There's such a small detail. I want to bring it up a little bit tonight so as to get Yahweh's people to say, OK, that's a small detail. But we're going to push it over there in the big crowded room of other small details while we keep looking at the bigger picture. And if I got to look at these men as part of the small detail versus holding Yahshua up as the big picture, then that's what I want us to focus on. See, some people like Noam Chomsky here in his book, Who Rules the World? This is Noam Chomsky. Again, like Angie's List, I'm going to do the review for you because I don't need you to go out and waste your little dollars on this. You might need some other thing. Listen to this. In an incisive, thorough analysis of current international situation, Noam Chomsky examines the way the United States, despite the rise of Europe and Asia, still largely sets the terms of global discourse. OK, that's true. Drawing on a wide range of examples from the sordid history of U.S. involvement with Cuba and the sanctions on Iran, he details how America's rhetoric of freedom and human rights so often diverges from its actions. He delves deep into the conflicts of Iraq, Afghanistan, Israel, Palestine, providing unexpected and nuanced insights into the workings of imperial power on our increasingly chaotic planet. And in the new afterward, he addresses the election of Donald Trump and what it shows about American society. So Chomsky's book, Who Rules the World, purports to deal with the people who really rule the world. A lot of people are excited about this. They like to see these left wing writers emerge and say all this soft stuff about it. Others, they are even more elated when the right wing pop up and do it, but can't differentiate for our people that both the right wing and the left wing are the two arms of the same wicked body. And when clapping together, they seek to destroy you. And you must understand, Yahweh's word gave us the up for the big picture to know and understand something. 
latest book out about world rulers. You ain't got to run out by it again. Is Davos Man, How the Billionaires Devoured the World. This is where this gets tricky because people know about the World Economic Forum and a lot of brothers. I spent the last 30 some odd years studying these different international global power groups because I know what scripture says about them. So as I study the international power groups, I'm looking to see which group does exactly what scripture says that a specific group would do. Because I know that if I got to look at it as the big picture or as a small detail, eventually I'm going to have to push a lot of what I learned to the side. Though I've learned it, it's a small detail. But when it ties into the big picture, then I got to hold on to it again. I wouldn't recommend you go out by it. I'm going to give you a brief analysis of what it's about. How the billionaires devoured the world. They are discussing a group of billionaires that formed an organization in 71, Davos, at Davos, Switzerland, called the World Economic Forum. This has been pulled together by Klaus Schwab and some of the wealthiest and most powerful men who have especially merged with great wealth and power inside of the last 30 years. So I want you to see and understand that though they're global power, they ain't the 10 that the scripture teaches us that's going to emerge and eventually agree to give all their power and all their strength up to the beast. Because, see, most people know I've talked about the Council on Foreign Relations, which is far older than the Davos group. I've talked about the Trilateral Commission and the way it is organized, which also emerged somewhere around the time of the Davos group. But it has more power and more sway than Davos, which is a bunch of businessmen getting together, <coughs> cooperating with permission from the devil to do specific things while getting the whole world's attention off of the real power brokers like these people right here who were brought together in 1888. And from 1888 to 1919, put together what would be part and parcel of the most powerful organizations in the world, tied all the way back to the throne of England and some other things that Yahweh's people are going to have to really come to understand. Unless we really know and understand small detail, know it, understand it. Sometimes you got to push it to the side. This is not the end. This is not the big picture. Some things have to unfold. So again, this is the annual report. This is the latest one that I have here, but I have another. This is the 2019 copy of the Council on Foreign Relations annual report. And it's a listing of some of the most powerful men and women in the world. And all of them ain't got to be billionaires to be wielding the type of power that they wield when they make these policy decisions that impact billions of people around the world. I hear it all the time. I try to put it in a predicament and or a position where we lay it to rest because the children of Israel are looking at so much. Whereas I know for certain Yahweh has messages somewhere that know exactly what they're looking at. And though they're quiet, see, I'm out here now. I'm out in the forefront. There is no running. There's nowhere to hide. I didn't fight and scratch and claw my way to the top. Yahweh said it and established it so, so that almost everything we were laying out and talking about was saying to people, we were saying it sometimes so busy doing the work. If we had the lecture in a room with no more than just two people, we taught in those rooms and then that stuff will catch on sometime and then you can lecture somewhere in the building it might be a thousand people we had a room one night we almost uh, a couple hundred people came out close to close to a couple probably eight or nine hundred people I, I know it was a big space and we know how many kids they had in there but anyway we would talk to people about these things and these days 30 years ago we had no idea we'd be living in it now to see it to a point and a degree where we say look y'all there's no turning back from this. This now is what it is. But suddenly everybody's emerging and everybody wants to do it. I don't look at everybody's video. I don't listen to everybody's information. I don't read everybody's material. Yahweh has barooped me in a way wherein like a kaleidoscope. I guess that's the one you use or not, not the uh, binoculars. What was the monocle? The one eye. I'm looking at something with categorical precision and seeing that it's fulfilling Everything scripture says that it would do. And Yahweh's people right now are looking at all this stuff, chasing all this stuff. We're caught up fantasizing to be like Hollywood, to be like the rappers, to be like the stars with all the money that they got. But Daniel told Israel as part of the big picture. 
They that obey Yahweh, keep his commandments, and they that turn many to righteousness shall be as the stars of heaven. The stars in this earth want you to worship them, and yet they have nothing that even fulfills their own empty, measly little lives. So you and I, as Yahweh's people, are going to have to calm down. Because, see, sometimes we can talk to church folk or little Christian folk or Muslim folk, uh, folk and different ones, and they have no clue as to the end time message, as to the severity of the times in which we are all living in right now. And yet they're looking at their Bibles every day and seeing the world grow worse and worse without a clue. And this is why now we as Israel have to prioritize our focus on the word of Yahweh and calm down. I know some of you live in cities and states where you feel as though there's nobody there. You go back and you look in the word at Elisha the prophet. After all that was done, I'm sorry, Elijah, he told Yahweh, he said, they killed all your prophets. They destroyed everybody and I alone am left and they seek my life to take it. But Yahweh had to rest him assuredly that he had 7,000 that he didn't even know about. That had not bowed their knees to the image of Baal, no kissed it. So we're going to have to know that because we got to overcome this beast. We got to overcome this mark. We got to overcome his image. We got to overcome his number. So we got some overcoming to do. We got some facts we got to line up. We got some things we got to be looking at. And we got to just calm down. Now, we're men and women now. You shouldn't have a dilemma every month, every time an elder talk with you. This month you got a problem. That month you got a problem. This time you get some of this stuff. It ain't no problem. You want it to be a problem. And then you want to say, help me with this or help me with that. Pray. He said, whatsoever you ask in my name, I will do it. Your mate ain't acting right. Pray. Ask y'all to speak to your husband's mind or your wife's mind. Show them that the way that you're living is right. You ain't got to keep fighting. You ain't got to have all this confusion and disconcerting efforts in your own home. Pray. Shut your mouth and pray. There's a war going on. They're using quietly corrupted false details to single people out for persecution. There's a, a, a pandemic of the unvaxxed. The unvaxxed are not the cause of the pandemic. And Israelites need to learn to stop feeling ashamed if by chance some of us fall ill with COVID or whatever the case may be. I was reading a book the other day called What Really Happened in Wuhan. When you read up on what really happened in Wuhan, and this is all documented, public record, government records, some of this material, you can track and trace it for yourself. But when you really start understanding what happened, you look up and realize these people are so evil, so sinister. They took something that most of us weren't even thinking about and weaponized it. They took a common cold, flu, basic bodily viruses that the body will fight off, they took it, cross-referenced it with other things, spliced it, and then weaponized it in such a way now where a person doesn't know if they got a common cold, the flu, or coronavirus, and yet have all been hit by a massive global weapon. Scripture tells us that the earth will be smitten with these plagues. So this is what it is. Big picture. You still have to obey. Don't let this stuff just sadden you, depress you, or get you down to the point where you feel as though you have no hope. In Yahweh, we have wisdom and strength. He is our hope. And he says in his word that Yahweh, he himself, in Yahshua, Yahshua himself, in Yahweh, shall be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. You all got to get on with the business of trusting Yahweh. Now, you should be ashamed of yourself, Israel, especially if you got a job. Now, let me add clarity to that. People say, what? I shouldn't be working? Oh, that's just what I need to hear. That ain't what I'm saying. So don't y'all go quitting tomorrow in there telling the man what to kiss. No, don't do it. Don't do it. What I mean, if you have a job and you work and get paid weekly or bi-weekly, you have faith that that man gonna pay. You have faith that that money gonna be in that account when you go to cash your check, or you have 
faith that that direct deposit is going to hit and you can directly pull it out and do what you need to You have faith. So then you better have some faith in Almighty Yahweh. And I'm saying it to you like a good coach. I ain't saying it in a rebuke. I'm a good coach now trying to push you to the winning end. You're going after the championship now just like y'all. So you better get some faith in Yahweh. Don't act like he can't do it or he forgot you. He never forgot a single one of us from the day he put man's feet on this earth. He has never forgotten us and he never will. My Afrocentric brother got all offended and jumped all over me about COVID and all this other stuff. Basically, he's championing the shots. And I said, we're all them Afrocentric guys. Now, I start talking to him very subtly, but using some of their vulgarities so that he can understand the significance of the point. Not talking in profanity and all that stuff to him. But I was saying, we're all them African gods you believe in. Which one I'm coming to save your ass now? That's exactly how I said it to him. Because, see, they mocked us for believing in Yahweh. But some of us fell ill, too. And Yahweh healed us and picked us up. He delivered us because he is our strength. Yahweh Vofika is our healer. Damn what the world says. And you all sitting around, one week you got faith, next week you ain't. You don't treat Yahweh like no old, decrepit, hidden bank account that you don't want your spouse to know about. You don't treat Yahweh like that. You don't go to Yahweh now and have an overdraft in prayer. You don't go to Yahweh now and get no bank fees because you don't pray much this month. You don't do that. He's always available to you. You go there and make a deposit. Bend them knees and pray. And you ask him what you want. Scripture says, make your petition known. That's the big picture. You can talk to him. Call the White House. Tell Brandon how you feel. Or Biden, do whatever they say. You all get that one later. Anyway, call the White House. Tell them how you feel. See if they put him on the line with you. And you know they ain't. But yet you can always talk to Yahweh. Now, it's the funny thing about talking to Yahweh. Anybody I talk to all the time, people always tell me the same thing. Spirit told me, yeah, Spirit said, yeah. And he gave me, and he told me. Everybody's always saying that. And I'm like, hold now, hold now. Somebody wrote me, texted me and asked me a very beautiful question the other day. And don't be offended by this. And the person asked me, beautiful question, they asked me, shouldn't we be conquering demons or shouldn't we be casting them out? And if not, why? And, and I, I thought it was an interesting question. So I began to explain it. And I reminded the person that, listen, there were a set of parents that had a child. Possessed of a demon, the devil jumped upon the child, the child throw itself down, fall out, have epileptic fits, throw itself in the fire, demon trying to kill the child. They did not lay hands on the child, try to cast the devil out themselves. So Israel as a nation, we have to read Yahweh's word and see and understand that for the time of the day, it was the modern age for them. Yahweh was dealing with Israel as a nation, but everybody in the nation wasn't a healer. Everybody wasn't a prophet. Everybody wasn't a prophet. Everybody, those jobs were still reserved to the messengers of Yahweh in a specific way, and it's still this way to this day. Remember now, they didn't take the child to Caesar or to Antiochus Epiphany. They didn't take the child anywhere and any and everybody, uh, Pontius Pilate. They went to the disciples. These were the disciplined ones. They had faith. They were believing. They were doing things, but they had not quite come up and hit the mark. But they did, in fact, have to take the child to the priest of Israel, the high priest. They took him to Yahshua, who then cast the devil out. Now, remember, Yahshua asked them, how long has it been since this come upon him? It wasn't like he was doing an investigation now. This is rhetorical for the parents. In other words, have you been paying attention to your child? How long has it been since this been on? That's what he meant by that. He cast the devil out. And the apostles later asked him, how is it we couldn't cast him out? So you see, it's not everybody's job. So Israel today, everybody thinks y'all was talking to him and telling him something. This, that, and other. Well, if he's talking to you, tell you, how do you have dilemma after dilemma after dilemma after dilemma? And he never seemed to deliver you out of this thing. See, that's what Israel's got to stop. He's dealing with us as a nation. We are called Dash Nation. Look, check it out, y'all. I'm not a mechanic. So I can't go in an auto mechanic shop and just suddenly stand up and take over and I'm going to start a show, start telling people, and you need a starter, you need a tire, you need an uh, oil filter, you need to. I, I, I can't be the star of the show, so I got to calm down and stay in my lane. So 
I can't go to the White House and jump up and say I'm the president and start doing You just can't do it. Everybody has their role. And whatever your role is, Yahweh put you in the role. And you got to rejoice in it. Some of us, he put us down, he made us so small. It looks like we're so insignificant. Doesn't mean nobody know me. Nobody believe nothing. I'm saying that. That's all right. He put you in the role that he wanted you in. Yahweh ain't talked to the nation of Israel like that. He called Moses out and told them, I'm going to deal with him in a way so that they will see and know that I am with you. They will believe it. And this is how he dealt with the prophets. This, you still have it in this age. You just need more laborers to stand up sincere and true in Yahweh. And that's what Israel's got to come to understand. You're going to need power in these last days. I'm telling you all, you're going to need power. We're going to have to stop finding fault with our shepherds. As you're going to have to stop finding fault with them. Let me tell you all something that he says in Jeremiah. He says that he will give us shepherds that will feed us with knowledge and understanding. He says further, shepherds after his own heart. Now, let me explain something to you all about shepherds. The book of Hebrews teaches us that we are compassed about with the weaknesses or infirmities ourselves. We have to pray and make intercession for ourselves as well as for the people. But now if you as the people are going to find fault with the shepherds and every little thing they do, this one ain't right, I don't like this one, I don't like that one, I don't like that, then who are you going to hear? I don't think that's dawning on Israel. Who are you going to hear? Now, again, if he say he give you shepherds after his own heart that will feed you with knowledge and understanding, do you realize that where you are at the time you are found by Yahweh, he have a shepherd there for you? You go to that shepherd, you think that shepherd's stupid, but yet Yahweh sent you there, well, does that make you? If he sent you there to learn under that man and you come up higher and stronger, whatever the case may be, then it'd be if y'all move you out, he move you out onto higher, greater and stronger things. That's understandable. But come on, Israel, you're not going to tell me now as a nation that all of us running around out here, we just that smart like that, that everybody's going to dispense the word of Yahweh. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I've seen a many effeminate men in my day stand before me and they think they're manly. They think they're masculine. There are things in society that we do today as men that other men from generations, just one or two generations ahead of us, they look at you and think, mm, what's wrong with that boy? That boy got a little sugar in his tank. What's the matter with that boy? That little boy, he done broken the diamond old sugar factory. So what's going on here? You know, now, I guess I shouldn't have said that, but it's out there now. Anyway. We have things, we have little weaknesses, little infirmities, little little effeminate traits that are not manly. Y'all ain't putting us out there like that now. Let's be clear, dear brothers. We, we got to be strengthened and stood up as real men and y'all sure. <clears throat> now, I ain't talking just Hulk Hogan masculinity now. I'm talking about a masculinity that is manly, that is assured. It is the quietness and the assurance of Yahshua. So that we ain't as men always having little family dilemmas now beefing with the wife this week. Oh man, she getting on my nerve. She this, that, and I'm come on. I never heard my father say that a day in my life. <clears throat> Excuse me. I never heard that. Not a day in my life did my father go somewhere and complain to another man about that. Yeah, uh, 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 mm, uh, we as men, we gotta understand women now. And we out here in this earth, as women, you got to understand men. And then we got to more importantly, we got to know Yahweh and know the roles. And the division of labor that he has granted unto us. Because right now, we're all over the playing field. Everybody looking at everything but what they should be looking at. And we all need to be looking at the big picture. Because right now, we are here in the world. We are suffering, man. Listen. They look up and realize that the end of the world is coming. They got new books and new rules for the changing global world order. Teaching one another how to deal with it as it comes. But yet... Probably one of the more interesting ones that I've read says to the people plainly, hey, look, y'all, ain't nothing from this point forward going to be easy. This thing going to be rough on us. It's shifting. And what I say to us as the children of Israel, we have to prepare ourselves now for times unlike any other. Times unlike we anything we've ever seen in our lives. If you are 99 years old and alive and listening to this message. Times are coming in the not too distant future, unlike anything you've seen in your 99 years. But yet, not unlike times that haven't been in times past. What we, this living generation, will have to acquaint ourselves with is a massive, disruptive change whereby things will never be the same. And if by chance some of us do not make it to see it at the very end, blessed are they that die in the Messiah, 
that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Do your best to prepare the generation, anyone coming up behind you, younger than you, do your best to prepare them for what the scripture says shall be a time of trouble such as was not since there was a nation. That's what we better be ready to prepare ourselves for. Now that is a part of the big picture. Whatever the wars that have been fought in times past, whatever the trials and the tribulations of all the nations in history in times past, something is about to come upon the face of the earth. Unlike anything any nation of people have ever seen since the start of all civilizations. That, my dear friends, is nothing to play with. You mean to tell me you concerned about landing a contract in Hollywood or you concerned about making it big to the top? You want the latest record deal. You want the sports arena and all this stuff. Come on now. You're not understanding the time frame that you are living in. This is not a joke or game anymore. Listen, y'all. We eh, now, now in this sanctuary here, now everybody want to cry out the little symbol of Yahweh. Now. We can't do it here. And we're not afraid of COVID, none of that. That's not what we're saying. We're saying in an era now where it ain't too safe to always be overly crowded, cramped up, especially when you ripping and running. We, we have a code of conduct here. This little congregation here, we quietly knew and understood and talked among ourselves and knew and agreed that we carefully maneuver throughout the course of our work week and our lives so as to not be all over the place. We ain't out at the mall, all at the Russell State House, all over the place, yelling at the football game and howling, all exposed to everybody we have, and then gather around each other. We, it ain't business as usual. We hear this little assembly, we go to work or whatever we got to do, we travel to the world, whatever, and we go home. We ain't ripping and running and all out in the street. Got to be at the mall, got to be at the store, got to get the lift. Just a restless soul. We go home because we understand this is a fight. And while Yahweh is fighting, every day of your life is the equivalent of that night in Israel where they didn't come out. And that's how you got to treat your lives now. It is no longer business as you. Yahweh is fighting. And you be careful how you out there in the fight. We got to know and understand. People get offended nowadays when you tell people, well, do me a favor. Don't talk so close to my face when you talk. Come on. Give me some elbow room, said Daniel Boone. Even Daniel Boone cried for that in the 1700. Elbow room, said Daniel Boone. Even though it was racist. But. We're just not in that kind of time, Israel. There is no more business as usual. It's time to, and I use this word, I made this word up, I took a, 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 a suffix and added it to a word. It's time to sirsen up. Time to get serious. Sirsen. Sirsen up. If it ain't a word, make it one. Spell it out if you want to spell it. Sirsen up. L. Johnson, 2022. Anyway, it's just that kind of time. It's time to be more. And knowing that the day is drawing near now, we don't want to be on the outside of that door when we begin to knock and ask him to open. We don't want that. We want to already be inside where once the door is shut, we are in the safety and tranquility of the greatness of the kingdom to come. That's where we as Yahweh's people need to be. I got a footnote that I was explaining to myself so much is and will be coming at us as a nation pretty soon that none of us will have time to see the big picture or the small details if we don't hurry up and take hold of the fundamentals of life in Yahweh through Yahshua now I got a note here let's go to Isaiah 63 4 real quick just for sake of looking at what I was trying to transfer over to my own sense of understanding see a lot of times let me, let, me, let me read this real quick. This is Isaiah 61, 6. Listen to what Yahweh said to us. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace, day nor night. Ye that make mention of Yahweh, 
Keep not sound. Now I ain't talking about these old rookies out here running thinking they go. I had Burke told No man gonna stop this fire me. There ain't no fire in you. Man, go on with that stuff. See, a lot of times we're so wicked and messed up, we don't know. We done been all out there and dedicated to the Lord and marked our little bodies all up there, tattooed ourselves, did all this disgraceful stuff that the scripture says. Then we come to the house of Yahweh. Now we're gonna get disrespectful and get disrupted. I've seen that so much. People who've come out of the church. But when they was in the church, they was quiet and honored and obeyed the Lord. Amazing. Then you say, now you woke, you come to the knowledge of the truth, you come to Yahweh's house, where Yahweh's house has rules. Now all of a sudden, Yahweh, keep not silence and give him no rest till he establish, until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. It ain't going to be a praise in the earth without the righteous. And it certainly ain't going to be a praise in the earth without Yahshua overseeing it all. And we are afraid to champion the cause. Well, let's go to Isaiah 63. You got to hear this. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart and the year of my redeemed is come. See how when y'all would bust it down, when he bring it, it's all in a specified time frame. And the day of vengeance and the year of my redeemed is come. Now, why would it say the year of the redeemed? Because starting right around that Pesach and all of the different things that take place, those feast days all point toward the kingdom of Yahweh. At one of the roughest times in the history of this universe, the Pesach will still be kept. Let's be clear on that. Shavuot will still be observed. All those feast days of Almighty Yah, those things, Feast of Unleavened Bread, all those feast days. The day of the blowing of shofar, the day of kafur or atonement. And as you all look forward to, the time of the sukkah. So when he says a year of recompense, understand what he's talking about. And I looked and there was none to help. And I wonder that there was none to uphold. Isn't that amazing? I would say, is there anybody here righteous? Is there anything? Yahweh wondered that. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. So Yahweh's own arm, which is Yahshua, brought salvation. That arm stood out as the final example of ultimate righteousness. That's why I said my own arm brought salvation unto me. Yahweh didn't need to be saved. I mean, his own arm. Nah, you step out there now and be the example. I was explaining something to a man the other day. Sometimes you explain spiritual principles to people and people are so carnal minded. They'll take a spiritual principle and run with it, apply it to themselves when it don't even fit. Anyway, I was explaining to a man, I said, true power works best when it is unseen. And I never pay any attention to people who have a little bit of power and don't know what to do, get carried away and just flexing, flexing, flexing all over. The place. I said, I never pay people like that any attention. Well, what do you mean? Explain that to me. True power works best when it is unseen. I said, well, Almighty Yah is the ultimate power in all this earth, in all the universe. He sent his son and he gave his son power to heal. He said he didn't even come to destroy the world, but to save men from their sins. I said, but the world tried to downplay that and they killed the son. They didn't believe he was who he was and they did not honor the power. But when he got out of that grave three days later and talked to those disciples, them disciplined ones, and ascended up into the heavens, he told them, all power in heaven and in earth is given in my hand. True power of Almighty Yahweh was upon him, and then it was extended unto him in that literal vessel the whole time. True power works best when it is unseen. You thought you disrespected the son and did not realize the father gave him what little power that he had in this earth, in that lifetime, and now he put it all in it to show that he truly is Yahweh Shua. Yahweh is our salvation. So he starts talking about true power, how true power really works, and how he did. Now you didn't know nothing about it until I explained it to you. Now all of a sudden he wants to show how he's a power, and he's this, that, and other, blah, 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 all this, that, and other stupid stuff. And my point here, we as Israel, we don't even realize the power we have with Yahweh because we're running around in panic mode and a lot of times just playing Hebrew. <laughs> My advice to myself, if I were just coming to this way of life, knowing what I know now, and if I had to go back in time and speak to my younger self, the first thing I would say to my younger self is do better than what you did do, but know for certain. I learned this from my father and the elders. 
I was never anxious to go running anywhere and preach and teach and stand up before the people. I was never anxious to go do that because I understood this is such a serious job. Preaching is the most serious job in all the universe. And right now, everybody want to be out and in front of everybody. Y'all, are y'all paying attention to how little Al Sharpton is? He ain't trying to be out in front of everybody now. The man's so little now. We got little babies here running around five and seven and eight and ten. They can knock him over. Well, he's been a big old fat man, real heavy man. He ate all of that stuff. It fades. It is only the power of Yahweh in Yahshua that should matter to us all. And we are heirs with him. If we obey and live right, we are joint heirs with him. Yahweh said even to the Gentiles, you got to do right now. Y'all got to press on. Because he said, I'll give you that as a name even better than that of sons and daughters. And don't y'all get to pushing that white supremacy crap now. Get to thinking, well, we're going to still be better than them even in the kingdom. That ain't what that mean. He mean, I'll give you such a name that honors that when it rained, people look up. They think y'all were calling it showing up, showing up Hebrew or something of that era of time. And that no, he give you such a good name better than that of sons and daughters. That's what he mean. He'll pull you right in and will not show that partiality with you all the way that your God has taught you to do us. See, you, if you're going to preach it, you got to preach against it all. You got to go against the white supremacy doctrine, ideology, the black superiority complex, all that stuff, everything in between. You got to go at it. You got to go at it. You got to go at it because the only real power is Yahweh and Yahshua. The only real power that matters. Look at your president. Joe Biden for be so meek, so humble. Joe Biden just mad at Donald Trump. Well, you listen to Biden speak sometimes. He'd be up there ranting and going all off about stupid stuff sometimes. Stuff that he ain't got the power to do. Get it there as a president and mandate. Mandate that people get shots and all this other stuff. I'm listening to a commercial on the radio earlier. They telling people, hey, well, in D.C., you won't be able to get into this building, get into that building. You won't be able to do this. You won't be able to do that. All this stuff. And people still don't see that this stuff is leading up to the marking and tagging of the world. I had a preacher standing here and tell me that that ain't how it's going down. I didn't even argue with him. I didn't argue with it because I knew something right then and there. Now, the way this thing is going, if you don't see that and you can't see it, then why would you catch on at the last minute? Because now you got to go back and undo all that you said, which means you were wrong all along. Now you see it. You want to spin the brakes and turn around, throw the car in reverse and go the other way. Y'all, we don't send his messages out there blinded. He sends us out there. He sends us prepared. Yes, right now, we are not seeing the big picture. I will mention the loving kindness of Yahweh and the praises of Yahweh according to all that Yahweh hath bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he hath bestowed on them, listen, according to his mercies and according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. For he said, surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their redeemer. You get it? In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of the Malachim of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. And he bared them and carried them one or two times in their history. No. The book says, and bare them all the days of old. Everything that Israel went through, every single trial, tribulation, every fault, failure, every stumbling block, Yahweh sure was there. What make you think in the 21st century now he's going to get tired and fade away? He this close to his coming and now he's going to forget you few that's left in there. He's going to forget you and me and others. No, you build your strength up in Yahweh because if you have to die in this earth from whatever means you have to die, you die in him knowing that he is not slack concerning his promise. Oh, man. And that's all it takes. Let me help y'all with a real quick lesson of how to overcome a headache. Headache, your job, the neighbor next door, the people you know, school, family, friends. This is how you overcome a headache. You put all your trust in Yahweh and all them headaches that you know are not internal. Man, you're going to have to dismiss that stuff. You're going to have to dismiss it. Man was talking to me on the job today, and I, I was thinking about something when y'all was wearing real heavy, and I had that thought process look on my face. And uh, I heard him, but I wasn't hearing him. He talked foolishness. So he says to me, you all right? You okay? I so, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. So, yeah, you don't look fine because you didn't hear a thing I said. And it was at that precise moment that I realized two things. No, I didn't, and yes, I did, if that makes any sense to you. 
Because I realized I wasn't listening to him. But yet I did hear everything he said. But yet I wasn't listening because what he said wasn't making any sense to me. My mind was on this tonight. How to get across a key point to the children of Israel. And the key point is you're going to have to learn how to ignore some stuff in Yahweh. That don't mean don't pray against it. But you got to learn how to let some stuff blow over. Okay. Look. In my neighborhood, this is the dumbest thing I've seen in, in the history of seeing snow. Two days, two days before it started snowing, they heard on the news that it was going to snow. You know what they did? They started putting chairs and popping cones out. Wasn't a flake nowhere. Wasn't even a speck of dandruff blowing in the wind from the person with the dirtiest head in the world. Wasn't a speck of dandruff blowing. They put chairs and stuff out there, parking and pulling off. Now, now I, I drive a big truck. I don't want no trouble or anything, but I got big enough tire where if I want to run your chair over your cone, I'll run it over, <laughs> smash and keep on going. Pop. I won't do that. But I'm just looking at them. So then the snow hit. We got about two, three inches of snow one night. And then the rain hit and fell right on top of it. Man, they had the cones in the parking and they got the spaces they got in. They about wanted to be hunking in or what have you. And by the morning, it hit the rain and done, washed it all away. And I was thinking to myself, look how the world prepared for that. Look how Baltimore City prepared for a damn snowstorm. And here Yahweh's word been blowing in the wind all the days in the history of our lives as a nation, as a people. And you won't prepare for that storm. That's dumb. But hey, man, that's the way the wind blows. That's the way the world going. You that are Yahweh's people, you have to be real cool and just know. You, you ever see, how, how do the people of Alaska survive an igloo, man? It's the funniest thing. They get out there and cut these little blocks of snow and make this stuff and cut their stuff in and, and hook it up so that it melts into one another. And they get in that little igloo where they survive in the cold. And yet in there, they have a little bit of heat. That doesn't melt the ice enough to collapse on that. This is the most amazing thing you would ever want to think about. Because y'all would give man a mind to do things. <sighs> but if man won't take that mind. And use it. To serve Yahweh. Then what good is the mind? You go through all that. And miss the big picture. Now, as I draw down on my conclusion, I'm going to finish this here real quick, but I want to draw, draw this conclusion now. What good is attempting to look at the big picture if you're going to ignore it and in the end be erased from it? And think about what I just said. What good is the big picture and looking at it if you're going to ignore it and then in the end, be erased from it. The small details of life, Yahweh told us through Yahshua. Stop worrying about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, how you're going to look, all the stuff. Worrying about that. Some of these miracles are things that have to take place. We just read here where he dealt with us according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. He doesn't have to explain to you how he's going to deliver you. He doesn't have to explain to you everything that's going to take place. And yet he loved you so much he did it. He told you in his word what he's going to do. Why are we sitting around here still worried about the man? With all due respect, the white people and their racism and their white supremacy, I ain't even bothered about white folks and their crap no more. Them folks so mad now, what they believe in don't even make no sense to them. It, now, that's a conundrum for you. You so racist and so deep in it that after a while, even your own people ain't buying it no more. See, white women going and getting stuff shot in their butt and want their butt to look like black women. Wait a minute, I thought you hated us so much. Well, why are you getting stuff shot in your butt to make your butt look like black? Are you painting your butts by the chair, any chance? Well, talk to me. Come on, fellas, y'all out there doing the same thing. Y'all want to get tans and all this other stuff. You want to do everything. You, you hate what you desire to be. But yet all you have to do is, like Yahshua said, it is enough that the student be like his teacher. Israel's duty was to take this to the world, take it to the world and teach them. But in the process of teaching them, man, let's live it. That's all we got to do. All right. In the affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them and he carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and vexed his ruach. 
They vexed his spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them. Yahweh did it. Then he remembered the days of old. Moshe and his people saying, where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Kodesh spirit within him? They want to know where is Yahweh now? He had that spirit upon us. We did all this stuff. We argued about him, built the pyramids, and did all this other stuff. Man, that ain't all we did. That led him by the right hand of Moshe with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name. They want to know where is he? That led him through the deep as a horse in the wilderness, and they should not stumble. And as a beast goes down into the valley, the spirit of Yahweh caused them to rest. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. Come on, man. Look down from heaven and behold from the habitation of thy holiness, of thy glory. Where is thy zeal and thy strength? The soundness of thy bowels and the mercies toward me. Are they restrained? Doubtless you are our father. Though Abraham know us not. And Israel acknowledge us not. Thou, O Yahweh, art our father, our redeemer. Your name is from everlasting. O Yahweh. Why hast thou made us to err from thy ways and harden thy heart from thy reverence? Return for your servant's sake the tribes of thine inheritance. The people of your Kodasha or holiness have possessed it but a little while. We had the land that Yahweh gave. We possessed it just a little while. Our adversaries have trodden down thy sanctuary. We are thine. Thou never bearest rule over them. They were not called by thy name. People get mad at me today for saying them people over there today ain't the chosen people. Well, they Isaiah saying the same thing. We are Yahweh's. We were, we were his. We were called by them. They were never called by his name. And you know the damn history. You know the history just as well as I know. You just read it, get mad about it, slam the book shut, and just say that it can't be true. Are you calling Yahweh a liar? I don't play with them folks like that. It's time now that we stand as a nation. You can put some people in their place by just simply getting in your place. That's all we got to do. All we got to do is obey Yahweh. We got to obey him. And we got to pray. We got to cry out to Yahweh right now. because We got some stuff coming upon the face of this earth, man, like nothing we've never seen. And I have never seen a nation that don't know the way. But fight the ones that Yahweh set right before them to simply lead them, to teach them, to plead with them, to beg with them. Yisrael, in conclusion, I do have one thing that I have to say. We can't do no more than we're doing here. I can't do every Wednesday night. Some Wednesdays, I got to be honest, I just want to go home and sit down and relax. I ain't in competition with nobody, no other assembly. We all should be working for the same goal. I can't come in and do it every week. I ain't going to do it every week. We do it as Abiyah commands us to do it, give you a little something to study, something to think about. Sometimes I don't even need a whole lot of scripture. Sometimes I got to sit down and talk to you. Sometimes I got to get your mind clicking, get your wheels turning, make you go back in the word. Listen, we ain't got to do nothing every day. We ain't got to have nothing online every night. There are between the three men that y'all placed here in this sanctuary. From this little building, people come here and see this little bitty place and they be like, huh, what? This is it? What were you expecting? A stadium? But anyway, from this little place, there are well over 700 messages on that channel. Well over 700. That if you review them and peruse that channel carefully, a lot of them questions you all got can be answered right there in a sermon, in a Bible lesson, in a study somewhere. It can be answered. Because the scripture does say unto you, how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach except they be sent? If Yahweh didn't send us, then every word that we've uttered will fall to the ground and woe unto our souls. But if Yahweh did send us and you believe that it is Yahweh's word of truth, then when you tune in with us, and you join the channel or you advocate this channel to your family and friends or whatever the case may be then know for surety that we're striving to do the best we can in the name of Almighty Yahweh. And we always pray that Yah be with our mouth so that we utter no lies or falsehoods out of our mouth. 
but that nothing but the word of Yahweh goes for. Yisrael, over this and the coming weeks, I'm going to periodically be mentioning things that are part of the bigger picture and tying it in to the smaller details in hopes that we don't get so overwhelmed and inundated with just the smaller details that we lose sight of the big picture. And in Ecclesiastes, he teaches us what the bigger picture is. And it's real simple. You got to fear Yahweh. You got to keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. It ain't got nothing to do with your job. It ain't got nothing to do when you clock in or when you clock out. It ain't got nothing to do with your wealth, your car, your house. It don't matter how many shirts you got, how many blouses you got, how many dresses or shoes or socks. You can have mismatched socks. You can hold in your sock in the front and the back. Makes no difference. It's about fearing Yahweh and keeping his commandments. We got to learn Yahweh's word in such a way we're not trying to be walking dictionaries of the word. We're not trying to be living, breathing Torahs. Yahshua is the Torah. All we want to do is have it so well within our heart that it becomes what Yahweh wanted it to be. That word is to become our way of life. I can't teach you how I go home, how I sit down, how I take my shoe off, how I put it on, how I brush my teeth, how I comb it. That is my way of life. I can't teach it to you in that manner. I live it. And believe it or not, that's what the Torah is. It ain't about you standing just reading words and you get fancy for it. No, there we go. Hey, old prophet in Bethlehem. Uh, 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 uh. Calm down, calm down. You read this. You understand this. You live this. You apply it to your lives. It helps you. It betters you. It soothes. It is a balm for all the sicknesses and the ailments of this earth and this lifetime. Yahweh's word is our healing medicine. But if you're playing religious, or if you think you're going to hide in Yahweh, or you're hustling, or you're conning, or you're stealing, you ain't going to make it. It was a big picture. And the big picture was right there from the beginning of time when he made man in his image and gave him dominion over the earth, over the land, over the fish, over the sea, over everything that is upon the face of this earth. He gave man dominion and man failed. But then he sent the man. And that man will not fail. And not only will he not fail, he must rule until he's put everything under his feet. And you know what? That makes me rejoice. I ain't got to bother the small pictures, small details. I ain't got to vote. I ain't got to get inoculated. I ain't got to go through none of that stuff. I ain't got to deal with you and your banking system. And none of that. When Yahweh said for his people to come up off of it, he's going to pull us up off of it anyway. Even if he make them kick us out of it, that's all right. You all stole the world. But we didn't have to steal Yahweh because he loved us and we love him. Because he first loved. May the blessings of Yah never depart from your home. Israel, please do me the kindness of a favor. If by chance at all I have anything of a rapport, you please keep me and this congregation in your prayers. But you keep me, keep this congregation. And when I say this congregation, I mean you, all of us. All of us that tune into this channel and other channels, wherever the shepherds of Yah are laboring, wherever the messages are laboring, if they teach and preach in the quietness and comfort of their own homes, if they teach from the beauty of a sanctuary, wherever they gather, if they're teaching from the privacy of a wooded area in the wilderness, wherever they are, pray that the shalom of Abba Yah abide upon all his people. In the midst of their sickness, their sorrow, their pain, and their suffering, Pray that Abba Yah give them a peace and sanctity and comfort of mind, knowing that they are one of his. Know for certain, Yisrael, that if he called you to the knowledge of this wonderful, marvelous, great, and glorious name, you are one of his. He chose the time to awaken you. Calm down and bask yourselves in the sanctity of that. And as Shalomo said, you fear Yahweh. You keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Don't you ever forget to pray for one another and continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem because it's coming, whether the world likes it or not. Hallelujah. I thank you all for listening. Shalom, shalom.